Welcome to SciArc. For those of you, I think we have some visitors here tonight. Um, we're pleased tonight to welcome a speaker whose work addresses um, what I would call the latent biotic potentials of architecture, raising the question, do we inhabit architecture or does it inhabit an environment of its own creation? Philip Beasley's work reconsiders the relationship between technology, energy, and biological processes in architecture, focusing on synthetic architectural systems, kinetic environments, that are informed by the formation, function, or structure of biologically produced substances and processes. These projects consider what I would call the entropic potentials of the interaction between biotic and abiotic matter in architecture. The separation of the biotic and abiotic can be and has historically been considered in terms of entropy. Construction equals minus entropy was an equation formulated by the metabolist architect Kisho Kurokawa in 1970 in his capsule declaration. Recent discussions centering on a more conscious and sustainable administration of energetic material and ecological resources in the production of habitable environments suggest a radical rethinking of Kurokawa's equation. A potential imbalance in that equation on an energetic level plays a critical role in the contemporary architectural discussion. The design of architectural environments that have the capacity to embrace entropic tendencies breeds a new strain of architecture. This architecture exploits the latent responsiveness of energetic exchanges, specifically the transfer of electrical impulses, heat, moisture, sound, and light through an architectural medium and the effects that this may have on more extensive ecologies. So I think we'll be uh, seeing some of these issues in the work of, of our speaker, Philip Beasley. I've had the pleasure uh, to meet Philip once on a conference in Montreal and was fascinated by his, his work uh, that I have been following ever since. And he also recently visited us here last year in the Mediascapes uh, postgraduate program. So we're very happy um, to welcome him again. Uh, Philip is a professor at the University of Waterloo School of Architecture. His work is widely cited as pioneering in the rapidly expanding technology of responsive architecture. He's authored and edited eight books, three international proceedings, and a number of catalogs. He appears on the cover of MIT's Artificial Life, Leonardo, and AD Journals, and has been responsible for over 150 architectural projects. He was selected to represent Canada in the 2010 Venice Biennale for Architecture and has received worldwide press, including Wired, TED, Discovery Channel, um, and other features. His distinctions include the Prix de Rome in Architecture for Canada, uh, Vida, uh, Feyadad, and a number of other distinguished performance awards. Um, very warm welcome to Philip. Thank you. Thank you for that very generous introduction, and I, I, I do hope that the material that I share with you this evening can be perhaps a contribution to the lineage of, of, of ideas that have just been shared. Um, it's very interesting to, to think about the, the tradition of metabolism and, and to think of a, of a new generation. I'm going to structure this talk tonight in, in five sections, and I will move from a very general discussion of figure of ground relationships to launch things in, into uh, perhaps an, an existential meditation on a relationship with the environment for architecture, um, focusing on earth, focusing on the fundament. And then I'll try to launch a series of projects by speaking about an original project which was framed about 15 years ago, Palatine Burial, re responding to the extraordinary labyrinthine mountain, art an artificial mountain at the center of Rome, um, built dur during the, ar the Archaic period and mo moving into, the, into the, uh, the Roman period, the Imperial period. And then a series of projects will be shared that focus on geotextiles, on a fundamental kind of engineering material which reinforces earth and which builds into a fundament of architecture. Um, I'll conclude with a discussion, a cultural discussion, that tries to frame this as a kind of dialogue with humanism, hopefully moving beyond in, into a discussion of post-humanist kind of modes. 
uh, trying to position it as a contribution to architecture. To, to launch this, to think about figure-ground relations, figure-ground relations are, are kind of a fundament of art history when we think about individual players and their surrounding milieu. And of, of course, this is a, f a fundamental kind of term for thinking about architecture. Now, if I were standing with you 50 years ago and I were thinking about this kind of, of mode, that is, the individual bounded territory and searching for the optimal kind of form, the optimal kind of architecture that might support us in the sense of, of standing in a void in a deliberate void and trying to earn our own fundament and trying to capture our world, then I'm pretty sure that an ideal form that would be taught us as architects would be that of a sphere. I think Buckminster Fuller would tell us that it would be the absolute optimal form. Minimum envelope, maximum enclosing volume, minimum kind of resistance with the atmosphere optimal kind of territory, a perfect defensible form. And if we think about a kind of an assumption that has been taught perhaps for 2,500 years in Western architecture, in Western conceptions, we could think of a form language that assumes that transcendentally pure crystals, reducing things down to an elegant minimum, is something that stands above us, that's something sta that stands us as an ideal as if a sphere, a cube, a single compressed point is elegant, is somehow more truthful. And of course, if we're standing in a Cold War and thinking about retaining energy or thinking about a threatened environment, then it would be absolutely true that a sphere is just about the perfect architecture we could imagine because it's a machine for resisting the outside. It's the most possible, it's the, it's the greatest econo uh, it has the greatest economy of it if we think of envelopes as expensive or excessive, and it's a machine for resisting interaction. And yet, if the agenda is to shed heat, to cool down, to interact, to seek interaction, to seek mutual relationships, then I think the arithmetic of this, these kind of forms would be that they're the worst possible kind of form. That is, that they can't po possibly interact because they are minimizing their surface. And I want to explore in this series of projects an alternate form language to that of reductive, elegant, minimal forms, the platonic forms that I was speaking of, of before, by speaking about diffusive forms, forms a form language that has the maximum possible reticulation with the atmosphere. If we think of perhaps dandelions, or the spiny world of, of a sea urchin, or of lettuce, or of coral reefs. We could think of a whole order of nature where instead of trying to be economical and holding our own territory, we have forms that, that are defined by the maximum possible interface, the maximum possible invagination and, and reticulation with the atmosphere. It strikes me as a very curious thing that this kind of, of language has been positioned as somehow corrupt and excessive and so, somehow degraded in past cultures. I mean, if you think about the late Rococo, for, for example, um, and, and th th think about different words like grotesque that are as associated with this kind of form language, for, perhaps you'll see what I, where, I, where I'm going. Um, but this, this is a language that I do hope to, to explore. Um, and I've been working with this kind of material uh, in, the, in the last few years in installations like this, 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 this is in a, in a Baroque church in, in Mexico, tr trying to, to explore a way of generating senses that are, re are responsive, senses that are, that are nearly alive, senses that are wound around us. In this work, the ethic that's being pursued is really very different from the power that might come from pushing a button and having a machine doing our bidding, that, that kind of amplification of our own power. Rather, this work works, uh, it employs tiny, m minute, delicate in increments of, of, of motion and response, trying to generate a sense of a, of a mutual, sensitive, 
flexible environment that earns the surrounding space. In, this, in these kind of environments, they're, they're, they're organized in multiple diffusive layers, such as this, this image taken from the Venice Biennale Pavilion, in the, uh, the, the Canadian Pavilion, where you can see hyperbolic meshworks above and suspended filters below, and a whole system of weed-like encrustations that serve to thicken and fertilize and render the atmosphere fluid and humid. Individual elements reach out and respond to you in rippling peristaltic waves, while at the same time, small openings appear. And I hope that this material, beyond an instrumental sense, an interest in innovation and work, working with fabrication, can also be seen as a kind of an asylum which is a beginning of a public architecture, that is, increments of small space. And when I say it's the public architecture, when I make that claim, I certainly wouldn't associate it with Tiananmen Square or the Washington Mall or Versailles, the kind of proud, axial, framed, resolved national spaces, but rather a kind of emergent public which starts with individual clusters of conversation and gathering tri tribal kind of interactions, working together in interchanges with the environment. This work then is founded on a sense of intimacy and touch and individual experience that builds into some common experience. Let me try and frame it by speculating about a relationship with the environment as a fundament. Again, I was speaking a moment ago about standing perhaps 50 years ago and thinking of a set of values that might have preceded us. And perhaps a fundamental relationship with the earth might underlie that. Um, in my own uh, surroundings in, in, uh, in southern Ontario, I have the luxury about of, of being able to go northward for about an hour and then standing in the open bush and an absolutely scoured landscape that, that is where the ice ages of the Illinois and the Wisconsin ages of about 200,000 years have scoured away the upper turfs and even the limestones, even the, even the, the, the friable upper or organically derived stones and leave only the basalts and the granites and the mantle of the earth itself, this, this absolutely solid uh, surface which is coterminous, which is continuous with the, with the inner, inner foundation of the earth. And standing on that kind of foundation is an absolutely delicious experience, this sense of being able to be received with the certainty of the earth, with the sense that the earth is absolutely, kind of unutterably there, receiving us. Now with that kind of historical comfort about the integrity of nature, and the comfort and reliability of the earth as being our home, we are received by this place, then architecture might have a relatively simple role. I mean, perhaps we could think of architecture as having the task of weaving a sensitive filter around us, perhaps expanding out our, our own sensations into that environment, perhaps filtering some of the turbulence of that atmosphere, tempering the, 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 the air, creating heat, creating shelter, but in general, working in a certain way with a very stable environment. And if I think of a rather different situation in this past hundred years during the modern project, I'm struck by how that certainty and the presence, the overwhelming presence of the earth is quite systematically removed as if it's a project to render independence from the world the kind of pride of stripping away tradition, the kind of delicious void that's created by release from religion and from parents and from nationhood, and instead achieving the kind of open terrain of not having any bounds on us. And when I think about that kind of existentialism, I mean, if, if it's okay to, to characterize the modern project like that, then architecture might have another arguably simple task, that is, of weaving a complete bubble around us, of, of making an integrated system that can carry itself. And I think of any number of, of 1960s projects, for example, if we think of Buckminster Fuller again, then 
the U.S. Pavilion at Expo 67, Man in His World, of being a, a complete integrated place, an, a, an, a, an absolutely uh, it, kind of integrated, se self-generating, self-perpetuating bubble as another kind of ethic for architecture that earns its, uh, its own integration. But what about a contemporary sense of a relationship with the environment? Um, because both of those senses that I've just shared are, I think we can say, historical. What of the surface of the earth today? What of our own relationship with the environment? I mean, each of us, I'm sure, has our own personal senses of it. But I can't escape thinking about the utter poignant uncertainty of the surface of the earth, the sense that nature is somehow trembling, is, is, is some, somehow wrestling with integrity. And the kind of certainty or the void of a, of a preceding generation seems like a very misplaced and, and uh, inappropriate kind of response. What of a kind of a stewardship or participating in, in something which is in such extraordinary turbulence and such, such extraordinary transition as our environment is today? It would be very tempting to speak immediately about sustainability, about reducing one's footprint radically and pulling in one's consumption to a radical minimum. The, the, the kind of responsibility that I'm sure we all share and I'm sure we all take seriously. And yet, I have this forlorn sense of the, the percentage improvements in consumption that are possible when reduction is the only response. Um, I have a sense that those, those relative reductions are utterly inadequate compared to the sense of transformation that, is, that seems needed and so I hope that this series of projects then might be a contribution to a sense of fertility and experiment uh, in which multiple boundaries might be found, in which many provisional, diffusive possibilities, experiments that create fertility, experiments that create regeneration, experiments with a self-perpetuating ecology might, might be generated. Let me underline then um, or let me start a series of projects by, by maybe making the task a bit more difficult for myself by, by going back to Rome and uh, sharing a first study that then moves into a, a series of diffusive, reflexive projects. So we're looking right now at the Palatine Hill, this extraordinary layered artificial landscape which started 3,000 years ago, uh, or let's say 800 BCE, with just a very simple uh, cow pasture on a hill at the center of Rome, and then was quartered and, uh, and, and kind of girded by, by, the, by Etruscan divination to found it as Rome, and then was encircled by a ditch, the pomerium, the, the, the sacred boundary, which generated the sense of it being the heart the, 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 uh, the, the sanctuary, the asylum of Roma Quadrata of the ancient texts. And you can see just, just uh, the, the, the bottom layers of the landscape in, in, in this image with the upper land um, now being used as a beautiful garden um, which, which was maintained since the Renaissance times, the Orti Farnesiani. So the Roman Forum is, is just, just below us. I'm, I'm standing in the Forum and I, I'm, I'm looking up at, at this extraordinary center of the, the original uh, town of Rome. Here's another image of, of this landscape. Um, at least the, the bottom two or three stories of this wonderful uh, 1555 painting by Bruegel, um, which we know as the Tower of Babel, is in fact quite a direct portrait of the Palatine Hill, this extraordinary kind of image of, 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 of this labyrinthine construction. And Bruegel's vision of, of this place is actually quite nuanced because he was a captive in Rome in 1527 during the sack of Rome, during, during, during which uh, Charles XIV's arm, army was 
breaking apart the, the previous Roman Catholic Empire and was utterly traumatized by, by that experience. And so there's quite, quite a kind of a poignant sense of the landscape being fraught and, term, and, and traumatized in, in this image. Um, here here is, is a condition at the, at the top of, of that landscape where you can get a sense of it floating and, and then it's, it's underscored by multiple arcuations, um, tabularia, um, uh, that, that, that is ma masonry arches that are inhabited for storage and, and, and for soldiers and, and for, um, for, for service alleys serving the, the passages of the, of the emperors that, 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 that emerged above. And here, here we can see um, a plan of, of, of some of the organizations. So my, my work during that year in 1995 was part of a, a, a team of archaeologists who were trying to gather together fragments from a number of teams, trying try, try to understand the topography. And then af, af, after a grasp of the topography, th th things got a bit challenged for me by, be, because of encountering some sacrificial deposits. And I want to go on and, and just share that material to perhaps to, to underscore some of the emotional qualities of, of the work that's preceded. Um, but here, maybe we could just in, enjoy the topography um, in plan. So over on the extreme right um, is a huge wall that Nero built um, after the fire of, of 64. And just to write, to write off the screen then is the Sacra Via, the sacred way that, that leads in, into the Ro Roman Forum and that retraces part of the pomerium, that, that is the sacred cut that stood right outside the, the, the walls of Rome and made a fundamental kind of architecture that, 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 that is that difference, a cut between the outside and the inside. The, or, the orange grid are, Hadrian, are, are, are uh, huge rubble-filled co concrete um, emplacements by Hadrian. And th then, then you can see the grid shift in the late Republic as, as we, we go to the yellow ma masonry and, sh and shift again in, into the, the lower layers. And underneath all of that at the center, you can see just faintly a, a tracing of brown, which is some of the original tufo walls from the very original wall of Rome. There was tremendous excitement when, when, when this was found as a sense of ancient texts being confirmed that Roma Quadrata the, 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 the fortified or original Rome uh, what was in fact established. And here you can see it um, maybe analyzed a little bit more clearly. Um, you can see, the, see some of the, the Renaissance works such as Vignola's Great Gate up the Ordi Farnesiani on, on, on the left just, just faintly and then some of the other constructions. But alongside, the, uh, uh, running up the middle, you see two um, gr graded tracks and that's the path of the original Tufa walls, or at least two generations of, of them. And in the upper right, you can also see a break in that wall um, and a cluster of deposits ar around them. And I'm not sure if you, if you can read some of the, of, the, of the text from there, but you can see that um, this is Porta Magonia, one of, one of the three archaic gates, the principal gates of Rome. And there are burned building deposits um, that, that, uh, that, that, that were deposited there in, in ritual to anoint the, the, the wall as a sacrifice to Terminus, the god of boundaries. And then more poignantly, perhaps more darkly, there, there are two infant deposits, one beside the gate and one immediately underneath the threshold of, of, of the gate. Um, Joseph Rickwert speaks beautifully about this material in, in his extraordinary book, The Idea of a Town, and he speaks ab about the, the ritual of cutting into the earth and of digging and of finding emplacement, a kind of transition into an agricultural society from the preceding hunt, hunter and, and, and gatherer society as a, as a way of finding place in the earth, of, of taking hold and of organizing cities. And per perhaps there might be a symmetry with some of the material that I, that I was just describing about released from the earth before. Um, here you can see just faintly underneath the, the huge Hadrianic, uh, or ha the emperor Hadrian's hu huge uh, concrete emplacements, some of those original walls. Can you see j just, just faintly in, in the dirt the, the huge tufa boulders that trace across from left, left to right in, in two lines. And if we look a little closer there in, in one corner, here is a dolium vessel, um, which is a clay pot about this big, holding a beaker in a bowl. And in, in that pot, 
was a little infant, a, a, a live human sacrifice, which texts would say is the first fruit of the first family, that is the Etruscan king, the Etruscan king who was the, the, the king of Rome right after Romulus, would have taken the first son and, and would have deposited into the earth as a kind of a blood sacrifice that absolutely charges the city, that make that, uh, that, that's given over to the god of, Ter of Terminus. This is a portrait of that baby. At least it's a, a statue of a substitution burial, a votive that was deposited in, in hundreds and hundreds of generations in related buildings um, around Rome and, and around Europe. And perhaps this, this survives to our day in the form of making time capsules and, and cornerstones. But what might we make, what I ask myself at least, what, what might be made of this little presence, this utterly forlorn sense of blood being given over into the soil and this curious, kind of wrenching sense of the fertility and the need for sanctuary of the, of the soil. You see the swaddling of this little figure and the fibula brooch uh, that's cl clutched around its, ar around its throat and its moon-shaped eyes look, looking up in, in this act of giving. It's a very, very curious kind of set, set of, of uh, emotions came up during, during that year, which started to take over um, the, the study that I started with was one of topography. I mean, I was fascinated with, with the labyrinthine, and I was, I was looking for kind of bub bubbling gen generations of, 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 dis of distributed labyrinthine form and looking for ways to model it us using er er then early digital co uh, computation and, and some degrees of fabrication and, and textile. And it, it was then underscored by a sense of, of kind of a native fertility of an utterly personal, intimate kind. Um, so I wonder if, if I can just uh, explore then some strategies for generating a response to this kind of material, this very disorienting kind of alterity. And I'll, I'll point to, uh, to one lovely philosopher and then, then I'll go through some craft uh, offering some techniques that, that offer some strategies and then I'll try and demonstrate how those are synthesized in a series of projects that I've been developing. Um, the philosopher is George Didi Huberman, a lo really lovely contemporary French philosopher and, and art, art critic. And he is retracing in a reading of this painting, which is Fra Angelico from 1455 or, or, or so, a painting called Noli Me Tangere, which, which means touch me not. So that this is a religious painting, right? It, 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 it traces um, in the Christian mythology the, the point when, when, uh, when the Christ figure has risen from the tomb and encounters Ma Mary Magdalene in a, row, in, in, uh, in, uh, in a road. And there's a kind of a fissured shadow that, uh, that, that, that appears between the, these two figures and an utterly charged sense of the surrounding space. Didi Huberman speaks about this as extimacy. Um, so he's not focusing so much on the dynamic between the figures, but rather on the sense of the ground itself receiving the kind of act that has just happened in, uh, in, in, in the, the rising of, of this messianic figure. And, Extimacy is a term that he takes from Lacan, the idea that instead of intimacy, we might have access, we might have a participation with air and with ground and with surrounding space that is absolutely charged, that has kind of a pull in it, that has a presence as a complete surrounding involvement, an inversion then of a kind of person-centered, bounded uh, uh, obsession with, our, with ourselves and with our own names. The kind of space of alterity, kind of a be beautiful conception, really tantalizing if we read it in words. But here, in this painting, Didi Huberman encourages us to look at how the late medieval painter, Fra Angelico, is treating the soil and the plants and all, all of the, the kind of crawling nature that surrounds this figure of, 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 of this risen Messiah who's on the, on the right-hand side. And you can see the stigmata in, in the feet and the, and the hands, so we know what that's about. But look what's happening in all of the plants as well, um, which are bearing their own stigmata as well, in a really extraordinary kind of, kind of rendering. Um, 
it's, it's not just painting wounds in every single leaf. It's also deliberately spattering and barely touching each drop. Um, I mean, there's, a, there's a remarkable analysis in, in this painting of, of the charge of the material be, being handled as, as being something that human hands can't even stain. And so, they're, so the, the, the wounds are deliberately dropped on and allowed to spatter in, in uh, perhaps in, in, in a radical version of the entropy that, uh, that my colleague spoke of. Um, I just, I, I find this, this, this sense, and anyway, tremendously encouraging the, the idea that there could be a pulling quality, a presence imbued in, in the surroundings. So that's, that's perhaps an ethical conception of a response. Um, and I want, wonder if I can go on, uh, if, if, if you'll move with me, to a series of craft responses of building a kind of cover for the ground in, in order to respond in a primary architecture to the Palatine burial that was just encountered. Um, a certain range of crafts readily present themselves, and, and one, one lovely one that, 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 I, that I've, I've uh, at least found, found tremendous involvement in is that of geotextiles and, and earth reinforcements. I have a familiar engineering class of, of, of building, in, for example, in this Japanese example of, of, of flood er, erosion control in which the precast matrix is set up and then turf eventually takes over and finds its own integrity. So, so there's a temporary prosthetic relationship or a, ro a prosthetic role, a temp temporary supportive role to the organization, to the material that, that's, that's set out, and, and then that in turn helps to, ge to generate something else which is, res is resilient and which flourishes. Here's a different scale of the same thing going on in, in this artificial uh, skin replacement by Apotex Industries. This is a biodegradable gauze and, and it's, it's uh, soaked with, with nutrients and these are gel capsules which are coated with human growth uh, skin cells and engineered skin cells, which then, after it's applied to the burn victim who's lost their, their, their skin, is, is allowed to multiply and generate, and, and a, a new layer of skin um, is, is produced by, the, by this, this means, and then the gauze is, is, uh, is dissolved and, and the skin continues to grow. Um, this kind of participation, though, be, beyond the, the, the kind of fabrication examples I've, I've given, perhaps has, has an even greater encouragement with the, the research of Donald Ingber, a, a cancer researcher in, in Boston, who in this slide demonstrates that things that we might think of as fluid or vaporous or liquid and therefore inaccessible to us as architects. I mean, I don't know about you, but, but I think if I, I, I like to be able to grasp things. I, I need to be able to structure things in, in, in order to design them. And so in the past, I've tended to think of water or air or soil as so very homogenous that all I can really do is just gather it and contain it and maybe focus on, on, on the boundaries of the material. Um, but Ingber here is speaking about a structure which is revealed inside a cell. When I was a, perhaps a good grade nine student drawing a cell like this, then I would have drawn the outside of it really carefully, you know, and I would have labeled it and I would have used my colored pencils to color perhaps the plasma and perhaps the outside if I was really energetic and wanted to impress my teacher. But, it, but the sense of what that material was, the plasma or, 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 or the surroundings, would have been utterly generic. It's just kind of there. It's just filled in. And I love the way that, that Ingber here has revealed that the cytoplasm, which is what we're looking at here, the, uh, this, this, uh, this, this, this viscous liquid within a cell, is in fact a, a, a viscous network of two proteins, myosin and actin. Actin make, making tensile structures and myosin making microtubules, compressive links, and those two structures work together to make this geodesic framework uh, which I hope you can see r running throughout this, which is in fact a tensegrity network, a three-dimensional tensegrity network. And uh, this, is, this is a kind of a wonderful revelation, that this, the sense that instead of looking at something as amorphous and therefore inaccessible, 
rendering us kind of passive as designers, that we can work with, with, these, with, with these milieu directly and kind of earn our way through them and, and assign qualities and build them. So as, as an encouragement towards building the earth, I found this to me a tre tremendously encouraging example. If we expand that out into space, then I'm also very encouraged by the work of Michelle Addington, um, a wonderful mechanical engin engineer um, currently at Yale, who concentrates on the laminar air flows around each body and, 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 and ar around buildings and, and reveals that there are a number of thermodynamic boundaries which are accessible which can be addressed through, through, uh, uh, through, through ma manipulating electricity, through impl implanting electrodes, for example. And we can visualize each of us as being a miniature thermal plump, pump with a plume com coming out that we bring around with us. And, and, and there, therefore, each of us is an active kind of agent with multiple boundaries around us. Kind of a primary conception of a, of a, of a lovely, uh, sensitive architecture of multiple octable boundaries rippling outward. Moving through those kind of examples, and I'm trying to speak about structuring surrounding milieu very actively, is a sense of the emerging craft of protocells. And this, this is a clip that, that I made with Rachel Armstrong, a wonderful collaborator who's, who's been working with the Hylozoic series. This is a trob cell, um, which, which is a model um, that was developed about 100 years ago, actually, by a, by a first art artificial life researcher, actually more than 100, uh, more, more like 120 years ago, by Dr. Traub, in which a copper sulfate crystal is surrounded by a potassium ferric cyanide solution. And the, the, the iron from, from, from the liquid surroundings condenses, precipitates to make a, a felt-like skin but then through an osmotic dy dynamic, the, 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 the solution migrates through that felt and pumps its way in and then bloom, starts blooming outward, creating ruptures, microscopic ruptures in, in, in the skin, which then fosters an, an increase of the precipitation. And so we have, have this kind of self-perpetuating self loop of skin generation as it exfoliates, as it reticulates and, and, and creates this in, increased diffusion. Um, so this is an example of a, of a, a protocell dynamic, that is a prototype cell, which uses artificial, uh, uh, well, which, which uses completely inorganic chemistries. Um, so this kind of, of work on artificial life is quite different from en engineering tissues or, or working with DNA, and, it, and it's refreshingly free from the kind of eth ethical strains that might accompany that kind of work. And instead, it's trying to, trying to work with some of the, of the material qualities that generate catalysis, that, 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 that generate uh, auto-generation it's, itself, that, that is the per perpetuate itself, and that start to replenish itself and start to loop in, in these kind of material processes. Okay, so I, I want to start moving then through a number of projects, and I'll start with a, a very simple one that starts with the kind of fundament that I started with in, the, in those diagrams, that is a kind of scoured earth. We're, lo we're looking here at the coast of, of Maine and, uh, uh, and, 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 and north, northward into, into Nova Scotia, the kind of ice scoured landscape of the coast. And in response to, to that, try, try to generate a, a sense of a sheltered landscape, I and, and a wonderful colleague, uh, Warren Selig, a textile artist in, from Philadelphia, generated a, a textile blanket called Haystack Vale use, using a, a, a cleared field of alder from a, from a neighborhood fa neighboring farmer. And this, this was a project which tried to set out a very, very simple kind of veil of, of, of response that would reinforce the earth and, and then, then would foster new, new growth, kind of floating on the, on the North Atlantic coast. Um, small animals burrowed in and, and, and mosses grew up and, and, uh, and it, it gently er eroded over, over, over many years. Um, in some related projects, work remained almost literally geotextiles, the way, the way I was speaking earlier, um, such as erratic net. This is on Peggy's Cove, on, on, again on the Atlantic coast, a little, little further north for, for sheltering growth around, around the glacial erratics, these extraordinary huge scoured boulders which have been, been given a ride on, on the ice 10 and 20,000 years ago and then settled ap after, the, the, uh, after the melting of the, of, of the ice ages. 
um, in, a, in another, in another uh, mode for the for this same series, there was an attempt to work with fog and and with tremendously thickened atmospheres and generate a sense of, of viscous strata that would bubble out and that would work with that kind of thickened in, environment. I hope you can see that, that kind of stratified um, system in, in this geotextile. These are extremely simple projects of working with material craft, um, of, of, of woven, woven wire, hand worked. More recently, digital fabrication has, has allowed uh, a more synthetic approach to the making of some aerial geotextiles, such as Orpheus filter, which was installed in London um, now eight years ago in Birmingham. And in, in this filter, there was an attempt to generate an osmosis, that is a kind of a breathing motion, a rippling, hovering motion of pulling air very gently through, the, through this very large filt. Um, it, it used a Penrose tessellation, which, which is a, a lo lovely quasi-periodic geometry, at, attempting to, to make a kind of resilient uh, um, matrix that would resist the kind of cracks that can go on forever um, that, are uh, that, that are characteristic of, of crystalline forms and organized grids. Instead, a, v a very, very gentle kind, uh, kind of in informal geometry that, that could reinforce itself using the, the kind of tessellation of, of Roger Penrose, that is the, the ten-way division of a circle in, in which two, two kinds of ROM can, can combine together, make, making local clusters but, but not eventually repeating. Um, tiling that, that kind of, of, of matrix was this series of pores ma made by deeply fissured mylar um, where, where, where a ma maximally diff diffusive surface uh, found an incurving form where the, where the forces that are characteristic of mylar, that is it goes, it goes through a heat process and, and, and so therefore one side of the sheet is, is, uh, has more tension in it than the other side of the sheet because of cooling, that could be released by, by, by cutting and so you have curved little fe feathered tines when, when you cut them in this way and when you combine them together then they can make a, a, a little valve-like form, much like a leaky heart valve and when these are multiplied by the thousands then, then they make an overall kind of mechanical pump in which material comes through one, in one direction more easily than the other. So it's a very, very gentle kind of mechanical pump, which is really fueled by the perturbations of your own movements as, as, as you come through the space. It's organized like an epithelium, that is a cell wall construction of multiple layers in which that kind of osmotic function of the quilt on, on one side, that is on, on the right hand side, then is supported by this basket work of very lightweight framing, which then has bladders um, uh, be behind it, uh, which, which then pull fluids into them. And, and so it's, it's gathering moisture for itself. And then there's a series of barbs on, on the right hand side, which work like Velcro, kind of finding purchase and, and try, trying to level and tr trying, to, trying to dig into surrounding soil. So it's an active geotextile in, in this mode. Here you can see some, some of the details that go perhaps even a little bit darker. There, there are thousands of, of, of little barbs, cl clamping glands that sit behind this osmotic, os osmotic quilt, quilt um, which pull material into itself uh, using perfume-laden lures and, and then dra draw fluids off of the organic clumping that would, would happen. So it, it has a very, very gentle kind of nurturing presence as a, as a hovering quilt, but there is the sense that it's also feeding itself and that you are bringing material that it wants. So there, there is a, a slightly convulsive und undertone to, to this work, while at the same time, its, its general attitude is tremendously gentle. Here's a more forlorn one which followed that, which is uh, the, the endothelium project mounted uh, uh, at, at UCLA uh, a couple of years ago. And in this one, uh, internal power was, was generated um, using little bladders made, made of latex filled with vinegar and, and uh, use, using copper and aluminum electrodes. Have some of you made potato clocks and lemon batteries, that sort of thing, right? Yeah, all of you, yeah, right. Well, they don't, they're incredibly forlorn, you know? Um, but there's, a, there's this lovely sense of, of presence that comes from organic material being able to generate electricity. And in this case, each of those bladders made five milliamps of power, which is just an extraordinarily little bit. But by chaining them together in series and use, using some custom 
capacitor circuits, we gathered the, the, the voltages, um, the, the, the power, and then set it up so that every five minutes or so, just enough power would leap out of, 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 e of each circuit to run a little cell phone vibrator, which is a very, very e efficient m motor with an offset, uh, an, an offset weight on it, which pr produces vibration out of forlornly little current. And those are set up at the top of stalks, which, which are de deliberately precarious. And so the vibration then re re results in a greater swinging action, which is then chained uh, and, and sets up a, a little lever which, which then drives a porcupine quill-like foot at the bottom of each of these tripods, which makes the geotech style that, that, uh, that, that you can see here. And so if you can picture the dynamic of this work then, over the term of the two, the two months of the exhibition with this power slowly dying as, as, it, as it exhausts itself, it's slowly burrowing itself in, into the earth and trying to, trying to find purchase. Kind of a re re really sad little, little, uh, little geotech style actually in its, in its presence. <laughs> um, there, there are also some, some uh, perhaps some more hopeful uh, details in this, where, where, where there are packs of, of, of spores studded and, and, and fed by, by the environment, uh, where, where, where there are yeast capsules that then clothe uh, so expanding cell cellulose fi filter elements, which spring out and, and bloom and, and fill the environment using ev ev evaporating paper clasps, so that, so that once en enough moisture has been been gathered, uh, then then, it, then it's ready to kind of spring into action and start to thicken itself. So th those preceding projects have been all relatively literal. That that is, in, in enjoying levels of craft, all circling around the sense of being kind of an earth surface machine. That is generating qualities of fertility using rather patient craft and, and textile, and. I'll, I'll focus then, and I'll, I want to show some, some details of the Hylozoic Ground Project, which was mounted at Venice, um, and, and which, which is continuing in a series of work, where some of those, those same strategies are, are used more symphonically, that, that is wrapped together in, into an, a more integrated environment. Um, the organization of this work is, uh, is structured in several layers. That is, they're hyperbolic mesh works, kind of a bu bu bubbling layer of very lightweight can canopies using a corrugated diagrid. Series of columns, which are organized as, as a grove-like form, which hold breathing pores, which are organized hel helically. They, 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 drive, they drive air through, through the system. And then suspended filters, which modulate the atmosphere. Um, and, and uh, which, which have a fair amount of, of concentration in them um, as, as mechanisms using flat cut ma materials snapping together. Um, here you can see some, some of the environment at, at, at work. Um, and at first, when you come into this, this, this kind of architecture, the atmosphere is very still and if you reach out, so a whole array of space sensors will track your motion and will give you a small amount of, of reflex, a small, small amount of response in, in which individual actuators, that, that, that is small kinetic mechanisms such as the breathing pores I was just showing, reach out and then send out rippling waves, a peristaltic waves. Peristalsis is, is, is like the, the domino chain in which part is, passes on to part, passes on to part, reaching out and, and bubbling around you. And those individual motions are very slight, but they accumulate together and, and, and make a thicker, inter-rippling kind of atmosphere that perhaps amounts to a breathing presence, as if the, mat the material is working with you and taking material from you and exchanging under its own agenda. It's organized using microprocessors, Ar Arduino, the, the open source system that's familiar to, to, to many of you. Um, and those are chained together in several overlapping networks, driving the helical chains of the breathing pores, driving the actuated filters, and then also driving a whole bed of acoustic resonators, which are organized as cricket-like fields that send out whispering amounts of sound as well. There's a hiccuping kind of motion that occurs in this environment because there's a lot of noise that happens because of the repetition of, of multiple systems work, working together. 
um, and maybe I'll speak about that a, a little bit later. But here you, can, here you can see some of the details, including the protocell nests that I was describing earlier, which are positioned as incubators with, within the, the suspended filters. And here you can see the, the crickets at work as, as well, these, these individual kind of presences. The meshwork itself is based on individual chevron, uh, very, very, very simple com components. Which, which are drawn in the studio and then, then man manufactured by the many thousand fold using snap fit technology and, and uh, that, that, that is to s snapping together to, to avoid fastening and very tightly nested together in a tessellation which reduces the material used to an absolute minimum. The organization of the fabric like you see in this film is of a corrugated diagrid that is a, that is a very simple textile that because of its corrugations can span and has kind of a, a, a lithe presence to it. Um, ra rather more structure than, than being a pure textile. It's not, not just to do, just organized uh, according to draping. Um, but it, it, it's able to make this, this primary kind of, of architecture made of a bubbling art, arching and, and can canopy system. Um, just l later in, in, in this short film, um, maybe coming up now, is a, is a series of drawings where you can picture the different layers, and I hope that'll, that'll help to, to clarify. You can see the meshworks above and the, br the breathing columns, and, and then the suspended filters, um, which, which organize throughout the environment, and, the, and then the islands of, of, of cricket fields. Each of those has its own communication system, which is radically simple. That, that is an organization of near neighbors and, f and far neighbors and, and timings in order to set up kind of blooming ripples of response, which then also set, set up communications between those different colonies as well in a, in a seri series of, of ripples and, and exchanges. Um, but the individual increments of, of communication are extraordinarily simple. I mean, uh, is something there? Yes, I pass it on. Shall, shall I pass it on to, to you as well? Okay, that, that kind of exchange. Here you can see the organization of proximity sensors going up to microprocessors and, and, then, and then driving the, the actuators, such, such as the, the cascading chains of, of these breathing pores. This uses uh, shape memory alloy, which is really a, a, a lovely kind, kind of mechanism, which, uh, which contracts, and, and exp uh, contracts just about 5% under current. So it's amplified by, by, le by leverage in order to give, to give effective motion. Um, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll just focus on, on a couple of the details in the, of this environment. Um, here, some of the, here are the chevrons, the, the, the basic system. And there you can see so, some of the refinement, including some, some of, the, of the, the swelling forms that try to make the, the maximum use of, of the material. And the snap fit, these, these little bumps that, that, that allow individual sheets to slightly deflect. Move, move around a neighbor and then snap back in in order to create a, a lock which allows this material to work in tension as, as well as compression, setting up or, or like sort of qualifying it to, to, to work as a, as a textile. In, a, in other words, the individual elements chain together and then make long fi fi fiber structures. And here you can see the tessellation, that is, that is the deep nesting that reduces the material use to, to, uh, to a, an absolute minimum and the hyperbolic meshworks that result. Um, and when I, when I say hyperbolic, I'm sort of encouraged by the sense that this is a, a, a relatively simple term. Um, that is, as, as, any, as any crocheter or knitter knows, you can make one row of loops or, or stitches, and then you can make another row, and you can work very hard so, so long as they're equally balanced with, with equal tension in each of the stitches, and you got the numbers right, you can make a flat sheet. On the other hand, if in the next row you add a stitch, and, in, in, and if in the next row you add two stitches after that, then things start to swell and warp, and the surface crams and starts to reticulate as nature knows when it makes lettuce, for example, or cauliflower, or, or, or broccoli. So I love, love the sense that hyperbolics are, in fact, really straightforward. Um, here, here you can see some of the, some of the specialized links that, 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 ma that make the, the lily forms of, of the mesh work, being specialized in, in order to handle Dif different axes of and and uh, and thickenings to handle more f more force. Now, crowding the surface of that meshwork is a whole series of glands and bladders that 
have a couple of different functions. They make the, 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 the layers of the system fluid and viscous and, hu and humid. And some of them are filled with salt, so they have a hygroscopic function that, that is pulling fluids into themselves. And, and others of them are, are charged with nutrients and, and, and they, they have cramps and, 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 uh, and, and needles in them so that they puncture outward and they spread materials. So these, these are very simple sets of, of exchangers that thicken the atmosphere. Protocell incubators are studied in, in the suspended filters as well. And here we can see one of them, the, the prototype cells that I was showing earlier. And in, in this case, there, there are several dozens of, of, of these flasks. Each one of them has a, has a, a capacitance sensor that is a, a, a whisker hanging down, which, it, which if it's touched, will, will send up a signal to a local microprocessor. And, th and that will generate a couple more responses. Um, the, the filters that are, that are sitting around it will, will respond and pump air gently, and conditioning the atmosphere, and also an, a, a, a pack of LEDs will bloom out yeah, in, 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 a, in a ramp, kind of a, a rather violent um, uh, burst of, of, of light um, at the bottom in order to stimulate its growth. And here, here you can see one of them a little bit closer. Um, so this, the, the, the protocells are at this point kind of protected by, by glass flasks. Um, but in the future, the, the hope is that we'll, we're going to be able to, to move them into, into open terrain so that they're making the fibers that I was showing, showing you in the, uh, in the Traub cell system and using them to clothe the, 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 the geotextile. Um, here you, you can see some of the fibers that, that we have been able to, to get going in the open air. This, so this, this, this is a, a fer ferrous uh, kind, of, kind of deposit working together with the copper sulfate alginate solution, this, 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 this rather, rather thickened slurry. Um, so right now, the, this, this material is, is working safely, and it makes an awfully sticky mess if, it, if it, it's out of its flask. But I guess the, the hope would be that this material could make a kind of active surface, a, a clothing for the surrounding meshworks, which would allow the building to, to process the environmental material by ab absorbing carbon and absorbing toxins. So picture the building sneezing in a positive way, please. Okay, um, I've talked about a position of this work as a kind of emotional response and a cultural response, and I, I, I hope you'll you'll uh, just go with me in, into a bit more of association in order to position this work as a kind of response to humanism. Um, I've spoken about a preceding arrangement, a preceding set of values, which have seen a wish to emphasize boundaries, a wish to emphasize a sense of territory, of distinction, of a minimum amount of exposure to the world as, a, as being a kind of an efficiency. I'm talking about a, a modern project, a kind of optimal form when I describe things that way, that form language. And may, maybe I could anchor that by describing a, a way of relating to the environment as humanism. And by humanism, I'm talking about a 500-year tradition um, where humans are conceived as precious beings that need to be protected and that have extraordinary qualities and an extraordinary mission of governance and of value in populating the earth. Um, maybe I could anchor that by, by showing a couple of images such as this one. This is, this is by Lorenzo de Credi, 1555. It's a beautiful Christian scene. Um, the Annunciation, here's Gabriel speaking to the Virgin Mary and saying, you're going to conceive. And if we focus only on the relationship between those two figures for a moment, rather than on the surrounding environment, then it's pretty difficult not to be moved by it. Um, and to think that this is a mission, a moral and ethical and cultural mission that, that still absolutely defines what we're doing today in, tr in tr trying to craft, craft our, our own work and in, in trying to choose what it is that's important to do. I mean, when I think of this kind of earnest a be beautiful stance, this dynamic stance of Gabriel, or the, the contrapposto, this, this lovely kind of lithe posture of Mary, then we see 
the most extraordinary kind of sensitivity pass between them. And we start to think about the humanist canon, that is, of being just to each other, of being responsible, of, 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 cre of creating a sensitive world between human humanity. I guess my objection to the scene is that the frame speaks of a stripped stage. And that stage is framed very clearly for the action of those inhabitants, the humans. It's in their service. I mean, we might think of an architecture like, say, Mies van der Rohe's Neue Staatsgallery in, in, in Berlin as being an epitome of this kind of humanist architecture. That is the idea that architecture exists to support us and that a free plane so that then we can find our own exquisitely sensitive positioning within it and exercise our, our wills is, is re really the way, the way architecture in a humane world can, can best operate. I guess I, I just find the, the kind of abject, utterly servile kind of uh, axis out into the landscape and, and the, the rigid symmetry of, of, of this figure to be really troubling in the sense that it sets up a hierarchy, an absolute hierarchy where it's really clear who's on top, which is humanity. And the sense of, the, of Earth, then, the sense of the surrounding environment is one of utter, utter servility, of inferiority. You know, I'll, I'll just show it another image just to, to, just to, to kind of offer this as, a, as a, a traditional way of seeing. This is Sandro Botticelli painting around the same time, and it's the same scene. And, and, here, here, perhaps, the, the sensitivity of the figures is even more you know, moving. I mean, this, this absolutely spectacular set of expanded physiologies that, of, of, of the veils that surround G Gabriel and this kind of radically free gesture of, of, of Mary um, speaks of just the, the most captivating kind of freedom when we look at their own dynamic. And yet, we look at the, at, at the kind of scored parallax of the floor and we see a, a rather different sense, or, or I, I would suggest the servile landscape that, that, that flows out behind them as well. So I look for some different sets of relationships that might involve a more mutual relationship with the surroundings. And perhaps we might find encouragement um, in, uh, in a sense of caring about the, uh, the, the, the exterior um, that might be a start to it. Um, I mean, this, this is uh, Bellini um, painting just a little bit later, and, and perhaps this is compelling, this St. Francis in, in, in ecstasy in this scene, um, which is located now, at the, uh, I believe, at the Frick in, in, in New York, of, a, of a, kind of a beautiful, immersive surrounding. And yet there's still an utter polarization between this kind of relationship, I mean, of, of this individual who is sensitive and the surrounding which, which is out, outside. I look a little bit before that, actually, to, f to find more encouragement. Um, this is a, a really intriguing painting by Roger van der Weyden. We see not only kind of the embedded sorrow of, 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 of the fact of the fable, but also the efflorescence of the wall weeping in its own mir mineral way. I mean, a kind of remarkable kind of resonance of the surrounding scene with the act. Kind of beautiful kind of, kind of pulling emotional experience of a, of a mineral kind. Um, now, I, I spoke about Didi Huberman's analysis of Fra Angelico in a similar way, and here, here's, here's the, ho the whole scene, uh, and, and we, might, we might be reminded of, of, uh, of the description earlier in, in this talk, where we have a sense of the ecstasy, the pulling of, of the surrounding garden. Working perhaps further backwards, I mean, not necessarily in time, this, this is Nera de Bici paint, painting around, around the same time, but painting carrying a Byzantine tradition. Um, so so, so have, having a, a rather different set of values, we see that this, this lovely vesica form, kind of a traditional ha halo form, which surrounds this figure. And I wonder if it's possible to see this as a primary kind of architecture that might position the, this, the series of works that I've been trying to share. What I love about, about this constructed halo ar around this figure is the sense in which it is utterly material and it's so very carefully structured that it becomes possible to, to look at it both as an expansion 
and also as something practical, to, some, something to participate in. I mean, certainly we can, we can see that literally, I mean, as, as craft workers in, in, the, in the filigree, the kind of con constructed, very straightforward geometry of, of, of the local halo around the head. Um, but also, I'm struck by, by the way the individual rays of light and, and of energy are, are constructed with, with this curious set of clouds run, run, running through them um, in, this, in the surrounding around her body. And then perhaps even, even more emphatically, the sense that this effusion of energy which makes up this surrounding boundary is so very carefully constructed that it becomes possible to be in it and for, for hands and feet and surround, surrounding people to be directly participating in, in this material. I love the materiality of, of that surrounding boundary anywhere. And, and anyway, and I, I, I hope that you might agree with me that it offers a, a, a kind of a fundamental architecture. Now, I'll, I'll just complicate it a little more by, by speaking about the psychology of this kind of material, by, by using Donald Winnicott's analysis. Um, as a way of, of, uh, of amplifying the purpose, the tangent of this work. Donald Winnicott is an extraordinary mid-century mid American psychologist who focuses on the infant psyche, on the formation of identity that, that happens in babies. And he expanded uh, this, this kind of study to, to develop a theory of objects and of a, a, a theory for architecture. And he used the terminology transitional fields for architecture. And the way, the way into his vision is to think about bankies. So did you have bankies? No? These things, right? Like this one? Some of you did, right? The ones of you that are nodding your head, I trust. Well, I had a banky. Um, and it was disgusting. I mean, it, it was it was a, a, a sodden thing, um, and I think my parents took it away from me very gently. Um, and Winnicott would have approved of that because if if we if we go in one direction, which is about how how people how how babies become comfortable as having their own names and their own boundaries and being able to have their own agency and, and t turn into individuals that have a sense of, of power and responsibility and free will, then being allowed to go through that transition is a critical one according to Winnicott. And it's critical because these things start uh, before we know that we have a name, before we know that we're individuals. And they work quite literally as a kind of expanded physiology. That, that is, as second skins or expansions of, of our own body or perhaps as pieces of our mothers. Um, and Winnicott ta talks, talks about that in one direction, where he, t where he talks about these materials, such as your banky or your lovey or your, f your favorite dolly, as being something that needs to be decathected, mean, meaning just kind of dissolve gently and not having a kind of polarized identity where you are suddenly told this is not you or you must negotiate with it. But rather, there's a very gentle kind of liminal transitional period in which you negotiate and then find your own relationships, a kind of a, con a condensing of boundaries which are negotiated and found rather than forced and polarized and shocked. So if we think about this as a traditional kind of uh, pa pattern of, of acquiring your own name, then we can see this as, a, as a, kind of a lovely chapter in the humanist tradition. We want to be strong, governing, responsible people, and so, so we'll value these things and learn how to leave them behind. But Winnicott also speaks about these materials and the kind of relationships, the amalgams that they, that, they, that they make up when we think about them and us in, 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 uh, in composite. And he uses the most vivid description when he talks about the kind of complex that, that happens before we've let go of them and before we become polarized and, and, and acquired our own names. And he especially kind of re reserves description for the period where we are even continuous with our mother's bodies as a kind of a, a, a curious, dis disorienting composite, you know, asking the question, who are you when you are not yet separate? 
And it's very tempting then to read Winnicott in reverse and, and to, to read him as speaking of these materials as being a kind of bridge into a composite experience, as being a bridge into a set of expanded physiologies which offer tremendous potential if we then use them to start thinking about the emergence of a public architecture, a common experience, or of multiple heterogeneous identities, rather than the kind of polarized, you're with us or you're with the terrorist view that might, might define some of our politics today. If we start to explore the possibilities of a composite. So I hope that that sense then of, of, uh, of, of Winnicott's transitional fields might be translated into a kind of an architecture that might offer us a kind of a bridge, a threshold state, so, so that some subtle and, and, and rather sensitive things can, can emerge. Now, in, in the case of this project, there's some practical ways that, 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 that we try to, to enact that, that kind of role. Um, one is perhaps by, by using a, a kind of a, an, a design equation which is defined by fragility and potency as opposed to efficiency and strength and, and durability. Um, often in the, in the exercise of, 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 de, of designing this, the, the, these materials, we try to draw out the, the individual elements right to the very edge of, the, of their ability to span and then position them so that external forces gravity, per, per, perhaps, or, or mechanical actuation, um, acts as a perturbation, which, which then amplifies it and creates in, inter-rippling. And this, this really creates a sense of potency and, uh, and, and turbulence as, as, as being the defining state of the, of, the, of the material. It might be thought of as a kind of homeopathy. Homeopathy in medicine um, is, is something I, I would approximately understand as being defined by medicines that, that, uh, that are stronger when they're stretched and, and diluted as opposed to when they're, when they're more potent and, and, and concentrated. And I, I, I guess that the sense of, of homeopathy with, with its thousand-fold and 10,000-fold uh, di 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 dilutions and, and tinctures is trying to get at a space, a reaction space, where it's my reaction to the material uh, that counts, as opposed to it controlling me and moving things around. It's kind of a lovely optimistic way to, to, to look at medicine, and, and perhaps it's an optimistic way to, to look at material design as well, in, in order to, to create the possibility for condensation to occur, for reaction to occur, for interaction and, and mutual exchanges to occur through opening and through stretching and through deliberately making things fragile. Um, I would also say that, that in, a, in addition to that materials, there, there has tended to be a strategy in which tectonics always have a kind of an agenda to them, that rather than sitting inertly and making junctions or creating boundaries, there's a sense that when things touch, they matter, and they may pull and desire at a surrounding material, or they may push, or they may dig in, but this, the sense that, that kind of the tinge of emotion that surrounds each, each junction um, is something that's very often developed in, in, in this system of work. Um, now, some of the recent work is, is, is devoted to emotional patterns, and that sounds pretty encouraging, right? You know, I mean, it would be really great to have architecture that cares and, and, and to, to make something that resonates. Um, so I thought it sounded pretty good. Um, and here you can see one of, one of, the, of the exercises of that uh, where, where, where we're set up with a, with, a, with a bed of space sensors and if you move really quickly, uh, uh, your, your motion is tracked and that's inter interpreted emotionally as being hostile, as being destabilizing and then the environment re responds by, by convulsing and by setting up very rapid in inter-rippling inter contractions. If you move really slowly, then the environment interprets you as benign and it will calm down and it will slow itself and respond and allow you to d develop a rapport with it. Kind of a, a very optimistic kind of empathy Im embedded in the performance, except that the, the tuning of, of those rather contradictory um, paradigms is ferociously difficult to, to, to get, get straight and instead this, this material is, is kind of locked in a 
pathetic kind of hiccuping reaction of ambivalence. So it simply, instead of creating em encouraging emotions, we've created mental illness. So I'm sorry. Um, okay, so I'll sum up. Um, I've tried to speak about a fundamental relationship with the environment, a historical kind of certainty, and a rather encouraging role for architecture in spinning filters and amplifying our own relationship. I've tried to talk about an expanded physiology, perhaps using some, some craft analogies, such as Michelle Addington's lo lovely vision of the energy boundaries that, sur that surround us, and the material kind of participation in, in, uh, in things that have formerly been rather inaccessible and, and homogenous by looking at them as, as, as being uh, sensitive structures and, and, and w working procedurally. The use of, of material systems and seeing things spatially inc increasingly as a kind of diffuse weather systems and, and dynamics, accumu accumulations of material has characterized this work. And it's also characterized by a, mat a material, a deliberate material manipulation which is based on fragility and by a removal of strength rather than an increase of, of potency. And this work is fundamentally based on a sense of intimacy and indivi individual encounter, working then hopefully symphonically and working with an artificial metabolism approaching, I hope, the, the, the qualities of emergent life. And if, if we were speaking um, again in the past, we would be speaking, if we were talking about life, much more symbolically uh, and metaphorically than practically. I think we'd be talking perhaps uh, about, about the, the almost eternal role of artists and architects of creating lifelike forms in the, in the tradition of Pygmalion, the, the sculptor who breathes life 3,000 years ago into the statue and, and fall, falls in love with it. I mean, this, this kind of it, it, eternal uh, biomimicry of, of, of being impressed by nature and seeking to impart symbolically through proportion, through, through, through lyric line, um, perhaps through performance coding, the qualities of nature and of life symbolically into, into work. But I think that, that today, certainly in, in the last 20 years ago, there have been some shifts of knowledge through artificial intelligence, through, through learning algorithms, through, through some really striking progress in, in, in uh, synthetic biology, such as the work of J. Craig Venter, who, who's, who's work in creating a self-replicating uh, uh, li little microorganism that, that, that is something ab above a back bacteria, an artificial cell that can build itself and replicate itself. Those, those systems of those, and, and oh, well, clearly the, the, G, the, the achievement of the genome project in which an instruction set for the forms of our own organism are, are pretty comprehensively understood. So th those layers of, of progress suggest that it's possible now to talk about life as not simply a metaphor, but increasingly something that we can work with and work with some stewardship. And so I hope that the, that the, the strategies and, and the craft and some of the experiments that I've shown you might serve as a contribution um, using some of the strategies of, of diffusive forms um, and might offer some possibilities for a new responsive architecture. Thank you.